Good evening. It's good to see you guys tonight. It's always uh, a privilege to teach the Word of God. It, um, it's a real honor. It's a, it's, a, it's a real honor to preach the Word of God. So uh, let's just pray. Father, thank you for this night. Thank you for uh, this wonderful worship that we had tonight, Father. What a, what a blessing, Father. What a blessing. And, and you are the high and the almighty, Father. We pray that your word would go out, Father, tonight in boldness. We pray that you would convict people. We pray, Father, that you'd give us the gift of repentance, Lord. Open our eyes to your understanding tonight, Father. Be a vessel fit for your honor. We love you and we ask these things in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Amen. If you have your Bibles tonight, would you turn to the book of Jeremiah? Jeremiah chapter 7. Hopefully we can get through the whole book tonight. I, uh, I just want to read a few verses, though, and then we'll, we'll dive into it. So beginning in verse 1, the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Stand in the gate of the Lord's house and proclaim there this word and say, Hear the word of the Lord. All you of Judah who enter in at these gates to worship the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, amend your ways and your doings, and I will cause you to dwell in this place. Do not trust in these lying words, saying, The temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. For, it, for if you thoroughly amend your ways and your doings, if you thoroughly execute judgment between a man and his neighbor, if you do not oppress the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow, and do not shed innocent blood in this place, or walk after other gods to, to your hurt, then I will cause you to dwell in this place, in the land that I gave your fathers forever and ever. So... This chapter that we're going to be looking at tonight, I feel, is, is what the churches and the people are like today. I believe that there's people coming to church out of habit, trusting in religion, trusting in their church membership, live like a heathen all week, and then come into church praising God, otherwise known as hypocrites. In essence, hypocrite or hypocrisy refers to the act of claiming to believe something but acting in a different manner. The word is derived from the Greek term for actor, and it literally means one who wears a mask. In other words, someone who pretends to be something that he's not. Do you know anybody like that? In Jeremiah chapter 6, it speaks about the judgment of God that is coming upon God's people as God is drawn the northern kingdom of Babylon to come and take the people of God into captivity. Some of them would die, some of them would go into captivity, but what God was looking for is for his people to repent of their wicked ways. I don't know if you remember the story in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 as Paul was writing to the Corinthian church, but there was a man in the church that was having sex with his mother-in-law. And so... <clears throat> Paul writes to the church and tells them that if this man doesn't want to repent, then there's responsibility. His response, there was responsibility was to turn, over to turn him over to Satan. Let Satan run this man's life, and hopefully this man would repent before he dies. Keep in mind that Paul was talking to Christians here. He's not talking to, uh, to heathens. He's not talking about people that don't know the Lord. He's talking about Christians. And I often ask myself, how is it that people can come to church call themselves Christians, and keep sinning and being hypocritical. I personally think this is a real problem in the church today. What people are doing is they're playing with God, living a double, double standard, and then thinking that it's okay to come to the temple of the Lord, come to church. And then think... Uh, uh, hear the word of God and say to themselves, as long as I'm doing these things, that it really doesn't matter how I live outside the church. That was their philosophy. That's, that, was, that was what they were thinking. 
Can I say to you tonight, do not listen to people who say, don't worry, God will forgive you. It's okay. You can do that. Yes, God will forgive you. But we're not to take advantage of his grace. We're not to sin will and will, willfully. Romans 6, 1 says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died in sins live any longer in it? So how can we act that way and, and live, in this, live that way if you call yourself a Christian? You see, Satan has deceived so many people that, that, uh, that tell them that it's okay for them to sin. It's okay. It's, you don't have a problem with this. It's okay. You can do that. Still come to church and praise God. He's deceived so many people. And on top of that, thinking that they're going to go to heaven. Listen to what Jesus said in Matthew 7, chapter, uh, chapter 7, verse 21. It says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Have we not cast out demons in your name? And done many uh, wonders in your name? And then I would declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. You see, Jeremiah was, was called to oversee the death of the nation. He was to watch it in its final agony before he died. He was to see it go under the heel of Babylon. In fact, Josiah, the king, had just died. And he was a king that had brought the word of the Lord to the people. And the people at that time were following the Lord. But soon after that, Josiah died, and all kinds, all, all of them went, away, all kind of them went away, and the word of God died. People were not walking with the Lord anymore; they drifted away. Kind of what we see in churches today: people following a man or following a pastor instead of following who? Jesus Christ. In the book of Ezekiel twenty-two, thirty. God was speaking to leaders in Israel, and he said this. Check this out. So I sought for a man among them who would make a wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land that I should not destroy it. And here it is. But I found no one. Found no one. Sad. So sad. Found no one. People were not committed to God, playing with God. And it's so, it's so sad because God couldn't find anyone to stand in the gap. Not a single person. I don't know if you know it or not, but Jeremiah was known as a weeping prophet. Why was he a weeping prophet? Because he prayed for 52 years that they would get saved. And, and none, of them, none of them got saved. They didn't want to change. He prayed for Judah a long time and nothing happened. Jeremiah was speaking to the people about sin in their hearts up to the point in life where he, the people didn't want to hear it anymore and so they were after him up to the point where they were trying to kill him. They even at one point put him in a cistern with a big old hole with just mud, no water, just mud. And he was up to his nose because they were trying to get rid of him. They're sick and tired of, the, of, of this guy preaching and, and telling the people they need to come to Jesus Christ. They need to come to Jesus Christ. And he says, we're done with you, Jeremiah. We're going to take care of you. And he cried out to the Lord, and the Lord saved him. But check this out. It took 30 men to pull him out of that cistern. 30 men. That's how far down he was and how thick that mud was. You can find that in Jeremiah 38, verse 6. And isn't, it that, isn't that what we really see in the world today, that there's a lot of people that want nothing to do with Jesus? You're out there trying to witness to someone, maybe at your workplace or wherever you may be, but they just don't want to hear it. And so sometimes they run from you when, when they see you coming, or they argue and they debate with you. Maybe even sometimes they'll get mad and tell you to shut up. Don't ever talk to me about Jesus again. I don't want to hear it. I'm not interested. I remember Pastor Bob 
said that uh, he used to work on the assembly line, and he was, he was witness to, to this one guy, and, and he kept witness to, to this one guy next to him, and, 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 and finally the guy says, I don't want to hear about it. Shut up. And so he kept witness to him, witness to him, and he says, I'll tell you what, you talk to me about Jesus one more time, and I'm going to stick you with this knife. That's how bad it gets sometimes. People don't have anything to do with the Lord. Matthew 7, 6, Jesus said, Do not give what, the ho- what is holy to the dogs, nor cast your pearls before swines, lest they trample them under their feet and, tear, and turn and tear you into pieces. A.W. Tozer wrote this, Always remember, you cannot carry a cross in company. Though a man were surrounded by a vast crowd, his cross is his only, uh, his cross is his alone, and his carrying of it marks him as a man apart. So if we say we're Christians, then there needs to be a difference in the way we act, right? We should be different from the world. And let me say this, if you really love your friends and your family, then we as Christians need to be watchmen for our friends and our families, the people that we love. A watchman was a person that stood on the wall to see if there was any danger coming. And if there was, his, it was his responsibility to warn the people, hey, there's trouble coming. Turn with me, if you would, to the book of Ezekiel, chapter 33, verse 11. Ezekiel, chapter 33, verse 11. It's just two books to the right. Verse verse 11. It says, again, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, speak to the children of your people and say to them, When I bring the sword upon the land and the people of the land take a man from their territory and make him their watchman, when he sees the sword coming upon the land, if he blows the trumpet and warns the people, verse 4, then whoever hears the sound of the trumpet and does not take warning, if the sword comes and takes him away, his blood shall be on his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet, but he did not take warning. His blood shall be upon himself, but he who takes warning will save his life. But here it is. If the watchman sees the sword coming and does not blow the trumpet and the people are not warned and the sword comes and takes any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at the watchman's hand. So the responsibility would be on him, not warning the people. So you see, if we have Christian friends that are living in sin and we don't do anything about it, we don't witness to them, we don't confront them, or try to help them, or pray with them, or speak to them about Jesus, then I believe that we're going to be held accountable for that. You see, it's our responsibility to tell them about their sin. So I'd like to talk to you tonight about the real problem I think that we have today, and that's religion, hypocrisy, and church membership. There's so many people in a church today that base their Christianity on membership. It's Sunday, we need to go to church, so they go out of habit. Instead of coming to church to hear hear from God, they come to church because it's it's a tradition. Or they come to church thinking that they're saved and that that they're a member of the church. Hey, that's my chair. I paid for that chair. I've been, I sit there for 20 years. I've seen that happen, believe it or not. The other problem that we have is that there are so many pastors in the church today and behind the pulpit that aren't preaching the word of God. It's a watered-down message. It's a feel-good message. They don't even open up the Bible. They read a little verse, and then they, they just talk about a story. And what's happening is they're leading people astray. People that are are living in carnality and thinking that they're going to get to heaven because the pastor's preaching that it's okay to live like this and then come to church like nothing's happened. You see, Jesus isn't looking for our sacrifice anymore in the Old Testament. He's looking for obedience. Jeremiah 6.13 says, Because 
from the least of them even to the greatest of them, everyone is given to covetousness, and from the prophet even to the priest. They, all, they have also healed the hurt of my people slightly, saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. Hey, it's okay, guys. It's okay. Were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? No. Were they not at all ashamed, nor did they know how to blush? Man, they didn't even feel bad when they sinned. And so what happens when you do that is you become calloused. And it's easier and easier and easier every day to drift away from the Lord. Jeremiah 6, 16 says, Stand in the way and see and ask for the old paths where the good way is and walk in it. Then you will find rest for your souls. But they said, We will not walk in it. Also, I set watchmen over you, saying, Listen to the sound of the trumpet. But they said, We will not listen. Therefore, hear, you nations, and know, O congregation, what is among them. Hear, O earth, behold, I will certainly bring calamity on these people, the fruit of their thoughts, because they have not heeded my words, nor my laws, but rejected it. For what purpose to me comes frankincense from Sheba, and sweet came from far country? Your burnt offer offerings are not acceptable, nor are your sacrifices sweet to me. See, the people here were fine and comfortable right where they were at. And God was saying, I don't want your burnt offerings. I want you. I want your heart. That's what I want. I don't want your burnt offerings. That's what they did in the Old Testament. I want you to repent. I want you to turn from your ways. But they wouldn't. So sad. And that's what we find in the world today. People don't want to have anything to do with Jesus Christ. 1 John 1, 5 says, This is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him there's no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in, walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another in the blood of Jesus Christ. His son cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. So John is saying, hey, if you're living like this, you're only deceiving yourself. And you're only lying to yourself. And if we're living like this, we're putting ourselves in a real danger. Because you can't hide anything from God. You see, there's a difference between sinning and falling short every day. I fall short every day. So do you guys. We all fall short every day. But to sin willfully and think everything is okay, no conviction, we're putting ourselves in a pretty bad spot. But if we ask Jesus to forgive us and we have true repentance, then he will forgive us. But there has to be true repentance. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We may have to ask him 10 or 20, 30 times a day. But if there's true repentance, he'll forgive you. So turn back to me, uh, back to the book of Jeremiah, and let's look at verse 1. It says, The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Stand in the gate of the Lord's house and proclaim there this word, and say, Hear the word of the Lord, all you of Judah, who enter in at these gates to worship the Lord. So this is what was happening. The people, uh, keep in mind that these were Christians, okay? They were coming to church to hear the word of God, to see the pastor. He wasn't there. Instead, they ran into Jeremiah outside the gate. Be like you coming into church tonight, and there are Jeremiah standing out there at the front gates, right? <clears throat> and he's telling the people, change your ways, change your ways. You have, here, so here we have people coming to church thinking that whatever I do, because I'm a church member, member, I'm saved. I know God. This is my church. I've been here for 10, 20, 30 years. I sit in the same chair all the time. I'm a member of the church. I'm a Christian coming to church out of the wrong motives, putting their confidence in a church or a pastor. It would be like going to a church where the pastor cracks jokes all the time. He tells stories about his life and the life of others. There's always something going on, food everywhere, entertainment. 
The pastor never talks about hell or judgment. And do you know that hell's mentioned more in the, in the Bible than heaven? But he never talks about it. Oh, we like it here. And so what happens is we have no ammunition to fight Satan when he attacks us. We don't have any ammunition. Why? Because you're not receiving the word of God. You're not being fed. You're not being taught the word of God. Or you're just simply playing church. Not interested in changing the ways that I am. You see, we can't put Jesus in our back pocket and then when we see a Christian friend coming, we go, oh, we got to pull Jesus out. Here comes Christian friend. Here comes Joe. And then, oh, Joe leaves. Okay, we can put Christ back in our pocket again. It doesn't work that way, guys. Number one, we're grieving the Holy Spirit when we act that way. Why? Because he's a person. We hurt him when we act that way. Instead, we, be, we should be saying, as Joshua said in Josiah 25, 15, and if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourself this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen? That's what we need to put on our front door. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Somehow these people that Jeremiah was talking about felt that because the temple had been restored and rebuilt, that they are going to be safe from their enemies. Everything's fine now. I'm in church. I'm in the house of the Lord. And we kind of feel that way, don't we, sometimes when we come to church. We feel comfortable. We don't have to look over our back shoulder or nothing like that. We feel very safe coming to church, especially with the security team we have. We feel very safe. These people were still sacrificing their, their, their children to the fires of Moloch. I don't know if you know what Moloch is, but Moloch was a, a metal statue with his, with his hands out like this, and they would heat that thing up so hot, and these people would come and they'd lay their babies right on top of the, my hands right here and sacrifice them, burn them up. Christians, they were still burning their incense to Baal. They were li living a sinful, hy hypocritical lifestyle, Monday through Saturday. But then when Sunday came around, they were saying, God, forgive me, forgive me. He's a loving God. He is. But the church isn't going to save you. The pastor's not going to save you. It's hearing the word of God being preached. As, Michael, as our pastor Michael does, then changing your ways and repenting, turning from your old ways, then trying to live a Christian lifestyle, have a personal relationship with Jesus. It's not a religion. It's a relationship that you need to have with Jesus. So Jeremiah is standing outside the temple of the church of God, and here are all these people coming into church because it was a tradition or a membership or something they had done all their lives because they were little. Their parents would take them to church every Sunday, so they just felt like, wait, we got to go to church. There's so many people that put their, their trust in religion instead of Jesus Christ. A false hope. Not really calling Jesus Lord of lords and king of kings. Chuck Smith said this, coming to church isn't really where it's at. Unless your heart and your life is dedicated to God. There's a lot of people trying to appease their conscience. Resting in church membership. Resting in past spiritual experiences or past rituals. But God declares here that you are trusting in lying words. That there is no salvation in these things. The church cannot save you. A ritual cannot save you. Only a living, life-changing faith in Jesus Christ can save you. And if your faith in Christ has not altered your life, then your faith must be challenged and questioned. Pretty heavy stuff. Jeremiah 6, 9 says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, they shall, they shall thoroughly clean as a vine in the remnant of Israel, as a grape gatherer. But, but put your hand back into the branches to whom 
shall I speak and give warning that they may hear. Indeed, their ear is uncircumcised, and they cannot give heed. Behold, the word of the Lord is a reproach to them. They have no delight in it. No delight in the word of God. Do you, do you like reading the Bible? I hope you do. You see, this is exactly what was, what's happening today. Many people in the world and even in the church today have no desire to hear the word of God. No desire to read, read God's word. They come to church, but no desire to walk with Jesus. As soon as they leave the gates, they're a totally different person. And yet some people are comfortable living a carnal Christian life. They have no delight in the word of God. Or thinking that it's just okay to just willfully sin. Because all I have to do is just ask for forgiveness. And if you find your, your, yourself in that place tonight, ask God to fill you with his word. Ask God to make him the most important thing in your life. Ask God to baptize you in the Holy Spirit. He will. 1 Peter 2.1 says, for the, Therefore, laying aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking, as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word, that you may grow. See, Christ wants us to grow. He wants us to get off the milk, start eating solid food. John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the light. No one comes to me except through the Father. John 15, 9, Jesus said, As the Father loved me, I also loved you, and abide in my love. So now here comes the warning in verse 3, Jeremiah 7, verse 3. Here comes the warning. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Amend your ways and your doings, and I will cause you to dwell in this place. So what God was telling us is this, that we need to really be a doer of the word and not just a hearer only. Stop playing around with God. Amend your ways. James 1.22 says, Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourself. If anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man observing his face in the mirror, for he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But if he looks into a perfect law of liberty and continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. If anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but, de but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. This is the Bible. I'm not saying this. This is coming from the Bible. God's looking for people that are going to be sold out for him. God's looking for people to follow him daily, wholeheartedly. God's looking for people to change their ways and follow him. That's what Jesus wants in my life, and, and that's what he wants in your life. He wants repentance. In the Old Testament, they would offer sacrifices to the Lord. God doesn't want our, sac our sacrifice. He wants us. There's a story of an, of an Indian, and they were taking an offering, and they had these big baskets. And so they passed these big ba baskets around. They were like this big. They passed them around. There's this Indian guy, and he came up to the to the front right here, and they laid all the offering, the, the baskets right there, and he got in the baskets, and the ushers are looking at him, and they're saying, what, what's this guy doing? But you see, what that guy was doing was he was getting in the basket. He didn't have nothing to offer uh, but himself. He didn't have any money. He just wanted to offer himself. He said, Lord, I don't have any money, but take me. I want to give you everything. I want, I want you to take me, and I'm getting in this basket. That's what God wants from us. God's looking for people that are sold out for him. Amend your ways and your doings, and I will cause you to dwell in this place. What we need in, in this world and in the churches today is we need revival. Because, you see, if you're not really following the Lord, you're not going to be living with your girlfriend or your boyfriend before you get married. You're not going to be, you're going to put your foot down and say, no, we're not going to, to do this till we get married. That's fornication. You're not going to be drinking al alcohol and getting high and come to church the next day like it's nothing. You're not going to be stealing. You're not going to be lying. You're not going to be living a double standard life. Why? Because if you're truly born again, if you're truly a Christian, God's not going to let you get away with it. He will convict you. Hey, if, you're, if you're doing these things and the Lord's not convicting you, there's no remorse for what you, the, the things that you're doing. I would ask myself, am I really born again? There has to be a change 
in your life. If no, and if there's no change, then maybe we need to step back and look at our lives and check our, check our do an do a inventory and see what's, what, what the sin is. Remember, Jeremiah is standing outside the temple telling the people, repent, repent, repent. And they were playing with God. They loved the lifestyle that they were in. I was that way. I loved my lifestyle the way I was until the Lord grabbed a hold of me. But I wasn't a Christian. These were Christians. That's why we need to examine ourselves every day because we sin. And when we sin, we lose fellowship with God. And that's why we need to hold short accounts with God. And what I mean by that is like when you sin, immediately ask the Lord to forgive you. That way it's easier. You, you don't go through the whole day because the longer you wait, the harder it is. John 15, Jesus said, abide in me. You see, God gives us a free will to sin or to abide in him. We, we have a choice. It's all about choices in life. You can do what you want to do. In Matthew chapter 7, Jesus said that you will know, you will be known by your fruits. Or the parable of the sower. Let me read it, let me read it to you. Matthew 13, 3. A farmer went out to sow his seeds, and as he was scattering the seed, some fell among the paths, and the birds came and ate it up. So really, no, no real faith. It fell away. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quick, quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because there was no roots. They didn't have any root, no, no ground in, in the word of God. Other seeds fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants, the cares of the world. They got sucked into the world. Still others fell on good soil where it produced a crop 160, 30 times what was sown. Talking about real believers. Whoever has ears, let him hear. Jeremiah chapter, uh, verse 4. Do not trust in these, thing, these lying words, saying the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these. Now check this out. For if you thoroughly, thoroughly amend your ways in your doings, if you thoroughly execute judgment between a man and his neighbor, if you do not oppress the stranger, the fatherless, fatherless and the widow, and do not shed innocent blood in this place, or walk after other gods to your hurt, then I will cause you to dwell in this place, in the land that I give to your fathers forever and ever. Behold, you trust in lying words that cannot profit. I personally think that the other real problem that we have in church is compromising. Oh, hey, I guess I'll go drink a beer with you. There's no, nobody from church here. They can't see me. I'll go to that movie that's rated R. I just want to watch, watch the sex scenes. I can have sex with my girlfriend or my boyfriend. It's okay. We're going to get married pretty soon anyway. Or worshiping idols. I, was in a, I went on a call one day, and um, I went in this lady's house, and um, she had a leak in her roof. And um, so I went inside, and she had this big old um, sanctuary set up. I mean, lights. She had a little padded thing where she knelt down. And so I said what is this? And she says, well, my husband died, and I, 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 I talked to, um, to Jesus about, about him, and it makes me feel better. And I said, are you talking to Jesus? Because she was Catholic. And I said, are you talking to Jesus, or are you talking to Mary? She said, no, no, I'm talking to Jesus. So that was good. And hey, and that's what makes her feel better, as long as she's not worshiping an idol, you know. But it, it, it was pretty, it was, it was, she put a lot of work into that. God said in Exodus 20, verse 3, Thou shalt not have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graved images or any likeness of any things that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water underneath. Verse 9. Check this out. Jeremiah 7, verse 9. Will you steal, murder, Commit adultery, swear falsely, burn incense to Baal, and walk after other gods whom you do not know, and then come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name. 
and say, we are delivered to, to do all these abominations? Hey, it's okay. We can act this way. God will forgive us. Has this house, which is called by my name, become a den of thieves in your eyes? I, even I, see it, says the Lord. You see, God sees everything in our lives. We can't hide nothing from God. Proverbs 5.21 says, For your ways are in full view of the Lord, and he examines all your past. God is telling the people, you cannot, you, you commit all these sins in your life, you live like a heathen all week, and then you come into the house of the Lord and you expect to hear from me? doesn't work that way. Has my house become a, become a den of thieves? It, it just blows my mind that people can really come to church after living like a heathen all week long and, and not be convicted or not really want to change their, their lives. They're, they're comfortable in that lifestyle. Remember in the book of Isaiah, chapter 1, these people were offering idols, living, living sinful lives. And the Lord said, don't raise your hands up to worship me anymore. I will not listen to you until you change. Don't even pray to me anymore because I will not hear you. You see, these were the kind of people that were coming to the temple of the Lord. No remorse for the way they acted, the way they were living. And I can't say it enough, but guys, these are, he's talking about Christians. People that call themselves Christians. Verse 12, but go now to my place, which is in Shiloh, where I set my name at the first and see what I did to it because of the wickedness of my people Israel. The Israelites had taken the Ark of the Covenant from Shiloh to use it in battle, but the Philistines captured it, and God burned Shiloh to the ground. God totally wiped out Shiloh because of the wickedness Israel did. Verse 13, And now because you have done all these things, says the Lord, I spoke to you, rising up early and speaking, but you did not hear. I called you, but you did not answer. Therefore I will do to the house which is called by my name, in which you trust, and to this place which I gave to you and your fathers, as I have done to Shiloh. And I will cast you out of my sight, as I have cast out all of your brethren, the whole prosperity of Ephraim. Now check this out in verse 16. He says, the Lord says, Do not pray for these people, nor lift up a cry or prayer for them, nor make intercessions for me. I will not hear you. And that's what happens. God was basically saying, hey, I'm done with you guys. You don't want to repent? I'm done. You want to live a sinful life like that and not repent? I'm done. And that's what happens. Don't call upon my name anymore because I won't hear you. Don't even pray for them. This is heavy stuff, guys. You see, we need to have a repentant heart. And I'm, not t I I'm talking about true repentance. Asking God to forgive you, then turn from that sin. That's true repentance. The short biblical definition of repentance is a change of mind that results in a change of action. Billy Graham put it this way. Repentance is more than just being sorry for sin. It's, it is a complete turning away from our total depravity. It's turning away. It's going one way and turn around and go the other way. Romans 128, and even as these did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting. You see, if there's no true uh, repentance in your life and you just keep on sinning like there's no big deal, then there will come a time in your life where God will just keep, let you keep doing what, you, uh, what you're doing, let you keep doing your own thing. Hey, if you don't want to keep, keep, uh, keep, if you want to keep on sinning, lying, and not truly repent, Go ahead. Why? Because God has given us a free will. But if you finally come to the point in your life that you want to stop, I'll be here for you, Jesus said. Remember, God never leaves us. We always leave him. God never leaves us. He's always there waiting for us. We're the ones that leave. Remember the story in the Bible in, in, in Acts chapter 5 with Ananias and Sapphira? Sapphira, his wife, came in there. They sold some property. And uh, Peter says, how much did you sell the property for? They held some money back. And she says, oh, I sold it for this much. 
And she lied. He said, no, you didn't. He said, you see those guys at the door right there? They're going to carry you out. And she died. Then her husband came in. Ananias. He came in. They asked him the same question. How much did you sell the land for? Oh, we sold it for this much. Same price his wife said. He said, you see those two men right there? They're going to carry you out, and they're going to bury you with your wife. Boom. Turn with me to the book of 2 Chronicles, if you would. 2 Chronicles chapter 33. Manasseh was 12 years old when he became king, and he reigned 55 years in Jerusalem. But he did evil in the sight of the Lord, according to the abominations of the nations, whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. For he rebuilt the high places with Hex Hezekiah, his father, had broken down. He raised up altars for the bowels and, and made wooden images. He worshipped all. The host of heaven served them. He also built altars in the house of the Lord, of which the Lord had said, In Jerusalem shall my name be forever. And he built altars, altars for all the host of heavens in the two courts of the house of the Lord. Also he caused his sons to pass through the fire in the valley of the sons of Hinnom. He practiced soothsaying, which used rich, rich witchcraft, sorcery, and consulted mediums and spiritists. He did much evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. He even set a carved image, the idol which he had made in the house of God, of which God had said to David and to Solomon his son, In this house and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen out of the tribes of Israel, I put my name forever, and I will not again remove the foot of Israel from the land which I have appointed for your fathers, only if they are careful, careful to do all that I have commanded them. So what was God doing? He's giving them a second chance. According to the whole law and statutes and the ordinances by the hand of Moses, so Manasseh seduced Ju Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to do more evil. Then the nation whom the Lord had destroyed before the children of Israel, and the Lord spoke to uh, Manasseh, Manasseh and, and his people, but they would not listen. Therefore the Lord brought upon them the captains of the armies of the king of Assyria who took Manasseh, with hooks and bound him with bronze fetters and carried him off to Babylon. Now when he was, a, was in affliction, he implored the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers. And he prayed to him, and he received his entreaty, heard his supplications, and brought him back to Jerusalem into his kingdom. Then, Mas then Manasseh knew that the Lord was God. So what did Manasseh do? He repented. If you find that there's no real change in your life, if you're walking in the same way that you did before you came to Christ, then you probably need to search your heart to see if you're really born again. Chuck Smith always said, if there's, no, if there's been no change, there's been no change. Matthew 7, 15, Jesus said, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravish woods, wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a good tree bear good fruit. A bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old man is gone. Behold, the new man has come. That's what happens when you get saved. Has there really been a change in your life? Let me ask you a personal question. Is there a place in your life that you would not want to take Jesus with you where you go? Is there a place in your life where you would not want to take Jesus where you go? If you're a real child of God, he won't let you get away with anything. The Holy Spirit will convict you. C.H. Spurgeon said this, Why is it that some Christians, although they hear many sermons, but make slow advances in the divine life, because they neglect their closet, do not thoughtfully meditate on God's word, 
For such folly deliver us, O Lord. Hebrews 6, 4, for it is impossible for those who once were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift, in other words, been born again, have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the power of the age to come if they fall away to renew them again to repentance. Since they crucified again to the, for themselves the, God, the Son of God and put him to an open shame for the earth which drinks and the rain that often comes upon it and bears herbs useful for those by whom it is cultivated receives blessings from, the God, from God. But if it bears thorns and briars, it is rejected and near to be cursed, whose ends is to be burned. So see, there needs to be fruit in our lives. And what happens uh, is, is God prunes us. Every day he prunes us, he prunes us, he prunes us. It's like a, you, you take a fruit tree, you know, and, it, and in the, in the wintertime you prune it back. Why? Because you want it to have big fruit when, in the summertime, when the summertime comes. And that's what the Lord does to us. He prunes us back. Remember what he said in verse 4? Do not trust in these lying words. Saying the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. They were coming to the house of the Lord because they felt safe. Going out, living all week like a heat and then coming to church on Sunday like nothing happened. They weren't listening anymore. They weren't listening to the voice of God anymore. They closed their hearts to God and the word of the Lord to them was just a reproach. They had no delight in hearing God's word. Do you have a delight in hearing God's word? I do. They were coming to church because it was a religion. Because they were a member of the church. They felt safe from the enemy. Luke 6, 46 is heavy. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do, and do not what I tell you? So let's ask ourselves these questions as why do we come to church? And I wrote these down. Is it because we're, we're trying to make our spouse happy? Is it because we want to see all our friends? Is it because this is what we've always done since we were little? Because we like the music or we like the pastor? Or are we coming to church to hear from God so that we can grow in our relationship with him? Or are we coming to church so that God can speak to us? Isaiah 30, verse 21, your ears shall hear a word behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. Whenever you turn to the right hand or whenever you turn to the left, Jeremiah 33, 3 says, call to me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. So back to Jeremiah, verse 17, do you not see what they do in the cities of Judah and the streets of Jerusalem? Verse 18, the children gather wood and father, uh, fathers kindle the fire and the women knead dough to make cakes for the queen of heaven and they pour out drink offerings to other gods that they may provoke me to anger. Do they provoke me to anger, says the Lord? Do they not provoke themselves to the shame of their own faces? I didn't leave you, you left me. Verse 20, therefore thus says the Lord God, behold my anger and my fury is being poured out on this place on man and on the beast, on the trees of the field and on the fruits of the ground, and it will burn and not be quenched. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, add your burnt offerings to your sacrifices and eat meat. For I did not speak to your fathers or command them on the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt concerning burnt offerings or sacrifices. Verse 23, but this is what I command them, saying, obey my voice and I will be your God and you shall be my people. There it is right there. Obey my voice, and I will be your God, and you shall be my people. And walk in all my ways that I have commanded you, and it will be well with you. Verse 24, yet they did not obey or incline their ear, but followed the counsel of the dictates of their evil hearts and went backwards and not forward. And see, that's the real problem, is they went backwards and not forward. Anytime we start work, walking backwards and not forward, we're in big trouble. God was offering them grace, but they, they didn't want it. It's so sad. 
Verse 25, since the day that your fathers came out of the land of Egypt until this day, I have even sent to you all my servants, the prophets, daily, rising up early and sending them. Yet they did not obey me or incline their ears, but stiffed their necks. They, they did worse than their fathers. They didn't listen to the prophets. They did whatever they wanted to do. Therefore, you shall speak all these words to them, but they will not obey you. You shall also call to them, but they will not answer you. You shall say to them, this is the nation that does not obey the voice of the Lord, their God, nor receive correction. Truth has perished and has been cut off from their mouth. Cut off your hair and cast it away and take up lamentations of the desolate heights. For the Lord has rejected and forsaken the generation of his wrath. For the children of Judah had done evil in my sight, says the Lord. They have set their abominations, speaking of pornography, in the house which is called by my name, to pollute it. And they have built the high places of the Topet, which is in the valley of the son of Hinnom, to burn their sons and their daughters in the fire, which I did not command, nor did it come into my heart, speaking of abortion. Therefore, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when it will be no more, where, where it will no more be called Topet, or the valley of the son of Hinnom, but the valley of slaughter. For they will bury in Topet until there is no room. The corpse of these people will be food for the birds of the heaven and the beasts of the earth, and no one will frighten them away. I'm going to wipe them all out. Then I will cause to cease from the city of Judah and from the streets of Jerusalem the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, for the land shall be desolate. I'll leave you with this verse here tonight. John 15, 9. It says, As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. And this is Jesus speaking. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide, uh, and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be, remain in you, and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all things I heard from my father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. And that your fruit should remain. That whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give you. So my, my prayer is that, as we, as we close here, um, that we would not be hypocrites. And I'm, I'm not saying that you guys are. I'm just saying that it, it's easy to be that way. It's easy to, to, to get into sin to, to, and then come to church like nothing's happened. It's so easy, but you know what? We we're gonna be all we're all gonna have to stand before the Lord someday, and we're gonna have to answer to Him. So we're gonna have a prayer prayer uh, team up here. If anybody needs prayer, if anybody wants to, uh, you know, surrender their life to the Lord, or get right with the Lord, or confess to the Lord, turn from their sins. Tonight's the night. Don't be ashamed. We'll have, we'll have men up here that will pray with you, and, and um, that's what the Lord wants. He loves you. He loves you. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for these people that are here tonight, Father. Lord, help us, Lord, to walk worthy of you. It, it's so easy in the world that we live in today to be sucked in and uh, there's so much temptation out there, Lord. Lord, would you help us to put the spiritual armor on every day, Lord, to, to walk worthy of you, to um, just be with us. Baptize us, Lord, in your Holy Spirit, Father. Convict us, Lord. Change us. For If we need to be changed, Lord, change us. We ask you to do it tonight, Father. Help us to do it tonight, Lord. Before it's too late, we love you and thank you for everything you've done for us, Lord. And we ask it all in the precious name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen.